A very common phobia we get asked about all the time, bees and wasps, and particularly seasonally when it's coming up to spring and summer. So here's some tips to help you with your bee and wasp phobia. So the first step to overcoming your phobia is to accept that you weren't born with it. And the reason that's really important is because if you don't believe that, then you will find it difficult to take on new evidence as to why what you believe in isn't true. Consider the question, is it real in the world or real just to me? Now you'll know that it is real just to you because not everyone on the planet is frightened of bees and wasps. I'm not. No, I'm not either. Uh, and our children are. So we're a family of four where everybody has absolutely no fear of bees and wasps. So the next stage is to understand how your phobia started and then to challenge that. Now, most phobias start in one of four ways. The first one can be copied behaviour. So you've seen a parent get really scared and freak out and have a panic attack when they see a bee or a wasp. And therefore, just as you copied their accent, you copy their behaviour. Now, if that is relevant to you, then what we'd like to consider that that phobia doesn't even belong to you because nothing has ever happened to you. And it's really unfair to persecute a whole species because they did nothing to you personally. The second uh, way that you can get a phobia is by being told. So your parents might see you run around the garden, assuming you're running away from a bee or a wasp, and they tell you that you're frightened of bees and wasps. Again, bees and wasps had nothing to do with that scenario. It was your parents that told you. So again, try and consider that actually the bees and wasps are absolutely faultless. The third way that you can get a phobia is through what we call transference. That could be, for example, that um, you're in a room and it's dark and you hear a buzzing sound, which could be a fly, but you think it's or a bee or a wasp, you're in a heightened state of emotion because it's dark and you're little. So you transfer your fear of a bug to all bugs or bees and wasps specifically because you heard the buzz. Now, if that was the case, again, realize that nothing happened and potentially it wasn't even a bee or a wasp anyway. So again, they're being very unfairly blamed. Now the final one, which is probably um, one of the more common ones that coupled with uh, see, seeing and learning from a parent is if you've had an experience with a wasp or a bee that was upsetting and scary for you. Now that probably happened in childhood and what you have to do is address what actually happened and see it for what it is and not how it felt back at the time. Because the truth is that a bee or a wasp is so much significantly smaller than you that it actually fears you and to have stunned you if that's what happened, that could have only happened if it felt absolutely petrified and scared for its life as well. And therefore, again, it was only self-defense. It wasn't targeting you. It wasn't coming looking for you. It wasn't specifically about you. It just that it felt threatened. And the fact is, is that there's absolutely thousands of bees and wasps out in the world and if you got stung by one it's really unfair to blame a whole population that's like having your heart broken and saying i am never getting into a relationship again so essentially if you've got a bee or a wasp phobia you've never taken time to think what's the point of bees or wasps because all you've seen is of the enemy uh, what i'd like to share with you and i've got loads and loads of facts here as to why bees and wasps are amazing. And this is really important, isn't it, having loads of evidence? Because you've got to outweigh the lack of evidence, really, the lack of factual evidence against the truth. Well, well, well so far, it may be that a bee or wasp has never done anything to you, and it's just because you've, you've always you've been told, the four reasons that you even mentioned before, it could be one of those. But anyway, let's just talk about bees and wasps and why they're, why they're great. I mean, essentially, bees are a sign of how healthy or otherwise the environment is. They're a great indicator of what's going on. And not just from a bee's point of view, but from our point of view, because they can tell us changes in land use, habitat loss, disease, pesticides, pollution, they're a real um, gauge as to what's going on in the world. Also, bees pollinate up to one third of all the food that we eat. Wow. They pollinate 80% of flowering plants. Uh, they offer a massive financial contribution to society, not only from honey, but beeswax that we use in polish, all sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, they 
Uh, tr one thing that's really important to us as a species, trees, because they're the biggest creator of oxygen and trees need bees. So without bees, you know, are we going to be able to breathe? Probably not. Um, and, and, just, and, and also just consider from a, a bee's point of view, since the 1900s, the UK, the UK alone has lost 13 species of bee. That's really sad. And 35 more species of bee are considering, are being considered on the border of extinction. And is that because so, of, of humans? It is. Yeah, so, so we need to look after bees. A toxin in the bee venom, they've now discovered, uh, it's called melitin, and it may prevent HIV. So again, in the medical industry, bees are important. Uh, and research shows that propolis taken from a beehive can prevent cold sores, canker sores, herpes, sore throats, cavities, and even eczema. And this, this blows my mind, that bees can solve mathematical problems. Mathematicians call it the traveling salesman problem. Oh. And it can even stump some computers, and they are the only known animal to solve that problem. They are very intelligent creatures, and they would only sting if they felt threatened. And get this one, if that's not good enough, they've used algorithms from bees to actually catch serial killers because bees uh, will collect pollen from the hive but far enough away so that predators don't know where the hive is and equally serial killers murder people uh, within the locality but far enough away for people to recognize them and get caught and actually using the algorithms from the bees they've then passed that on to police uh, and they've used it in computer models to find serial killers, which is amazing. So that's bees. Now, talking about wasps, you probably think that wasps is a, is a harder sell because they don't look as nice as bees. And, you know, and, and to be honest with you, bees, uh, most bees can only sting you once and they die. So it's going to be a life or death thing for a bee to sting you. However, wasps can sting you quite a few times. Uh, but... The great thing about wasps is the world. We wouldn't have a world if it wasn't for wasps, and these are the reasons being. Wasps kill crop-destroying bugs, so we have a lot more food on our tables because of wasps, because they're killing the bugs. Farmers actually bring wasps now uh, in as a natural pest control to kill flies and beetles that would eat the crops. They are the best predators for aphids and black fly. And the reason why that's so important is because, and this is a, a statistic in the Guinness Book of Records, that the cabbage aphid is the most fertile animal on the planet. And it's got a potential of billions of offspring from one single female. And it's been calculated that in, in a year, that one female with no predation uh, could cover the entire planet in a layer of bugs 93 miles deep. Can you imagine that? Mind blown. Right? Mind and what what's killing those aphids? Wasps. That's why wasps are so important. If they weren't here, we would be drowning in a sea of aphids. So in summary, uh, again, looking at that positive evidence and from what Nick's just shared there, we can see that we couldn't manage without bees and wasps. Um, and Pretty much the contributors to some part of everything on the planet which is which is amazing. amazing we wouldn't be around if it wasn't for bees or yeah. wasps so essentially if you've had a situation uh where at one point in your life a bee or wasp has stung you it's not it shouldn't represent your life the good guys yeah and it shouldn't represent the whole bee and wasp nation if only one did something something bad to you as we said earlier and um, so really to conclude uh, the way to address your phobia is to first try and locate how it started and then how you perceived that event of how it started so if that was your mum freaking out what did you think and um, then see it what it is uh, and not how it, how, feels. It, how it feels or how it felt again back then bombard yourself with loads of contra evidence as to why what you a lot of the stuff that previously I believed yeah. that bees and wasps were bad or that they were harmful that they were going to hurt you because literally they don't know your name they're not coming after you and appreciate how amazing and, and wonderful they are and how they contribute to your life, our lives and this planet. Um, now, you've got to create new habits too now moving forward. So when we say new habits, what you've got to appreciate, whether that's a bee, a wasp or even a human being comes into your personal space, 
as human beings, we don't really like that. So don't expect if a bug were to come into your personal space for you to sort of suddenly be completely relaxed about it because normality is, is that we don't like that. However, what you now know is that if it comes into your space, it really isn't interested in you. And as long as you don't make it feel threatened or in danger, it will just pass by and go on its way. Uh, we have to share this planet. So I think it's a case of live and let live and to stop blaming pobbies and wasps for the fact that they're, that they're so uh, scary when all they're bothered about is actually just getting on with their own business and saving you, me and our planet. Hope that helps.